Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the BPCA webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about environmental risk assessments and, and non-toxic pest control. Um, again, one of my favourite phrases is practical implementation. Um, that's what we'll always get really to the heart of and um, just hopefully be really helpful for you guys that um, are tuned in today. Um, those that have, have been here before or regularly you might notice the background is slightly different today. Um, we've had our we've got our first regional forum of 2020 going on and uh, we lent it to them. Should we say they didn't take it without me knowing. But yes, yeah, so we lent it to them. So background's a bit different today, but hopefully that shouldn't distract you, um, of course, because I will be very entertaining and very um, it's some good. Uh, thoughts going with you guys, maybe some good questions as well. Um, for anybody that is new to the webinar, so what we'll do is I will go through a presentation. We've only got about 14 slides today. Um, as I said, it's you know environmental risk assessment. It's a relatively small subject, but a really important subject because I find a lot of members are very confused about um, the hows and the whens, really, in terms of implementing environmental risk assessment. So, yeah, pretty short in terms of slides, but we'll, we get halfway through and we'll do some questions just relating to the, the first uh, few topics that we've done. So while we're going through, any questions that you've got, please do put them up on the screen. You should be able to see there's an option for you to ask a question. You can be anonymous or you can put your name. It's completely up to you. I've already had one that's... Um, just popped up about CPD points. Um, so yesterday we've got one CPD point for the BPCA registered scheme, and I believe it's three points for basis prompt. Now, when you first registered, um, you would have put in your either prompt number or BPCA registered number, so it'll automatically be uploaded. If you're still not sure after the webinar, then just get in touch with our office and speak to Katrina and she'll be able to advise you on how to get those points. Um, so yes, just about those questions, I can't hear or see you guys, um, so anything uh, you do want to ask, make sure you put the question up. Just put the question up once, I will try to get to you. We've got 188 participants today, so there's quite a few of you, oh, 191 now. Um, so yeah, if say everybody asks a question, we may um, struggle to get through them all. Um, if I do get to the end, we've got an hour as a maximum, um, I'll try and keep my babbling now to a minimum but it's just important information to give you that if we get to the end and I haven't answered any questions that you've put up then um, you can get in touch with me either on email or telephone or contact the office and, and get your question over that way um, but I, I will try my best to get to those questions and again that's why I kind of kept the the, the slides to a minimum um, just in the un anticipating that we're going to get a few questions and hopefully some site-specific stuff, things that you've come across or questions you've had in your mind maybe a few days ago and you think, actually, you know, let's get it out there on the forum. And, and hopefully I'll, I'll know the answer to it. But we have got, as I said, you know, a lot of participants today. So if I don't know, I'm sure there'll be somebody out there who, who does. Um, OK, great. So let's get going with the presentation. That to the side. I'll get the screen up here. Okay, I'll just have another question while we're getting that up and running from uh, Philip. Can we download the slides? It's a very quick, you, uh, you won't be able to download the slides, but you can re-watch this web webinar. So it um, usually takes about 24 to 48 hours for the webinar to be available on the BBC website. Um, you can go through it through YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, you can re-watch this webinar and again you can get points for it but just whichever scheme you're on speak to that scheme administrator and they'll advise you if you're watching it later down the line either with some some uh, some of your staff or, or you want to watch it again because you found me so entertaining um great okay so another really um important thing to do, i mentioned at the beginning you know it's about the practical implementation of this um i'm not going to go into the 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 ins and outs and the history of environmental risk assessment, but we will touch on it. I'm just trying to get my screen to go here and it's not, oh, there we go. Um, so for the agenda today, we will we'll touch on why we have environmental risk assessments and, and exactly what they are. We'll just spend a, a bit of time on that. And again, if you've got any specific questions um, regarding that, we'll have a little question sessions just after that. Um, and then uh, we'll go on to, in the last half an hour, 20 minutes or so, the hierarchy of control um, and how to compile uh, an environmental risk assessment. 
Now, a lot of this information is uh, obviously available readily on the Crew Campaign for Responsible Rodenticide Use website. Um, there's lots of reading tools. I will mention some of them as we go through. So really important, as much as we've managed to cover today, it's really important that you go away and read some of these um, these uh, these, these um, uh, papers or and these um, tools, these, these network tools that um, for, for for implementing uh, environmental risk assessment. So we're just going to hopefully cover the uh, main important bits. So let me get going. <clears throat> Okay, so why environmental risk assessments? Um, really, is, I think a lot of you know the history of, of why we have a rodenticide stewardship. Um, but the short answer is that, you know, the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive, done a environmental risk assessment or a risk assessment on um, second generation anticoagulants and also first generation of which came along a bit later and said that they're not acceptable and that they pose too many risks to the environment. Um, the, the main issues being that they're bioaccumulative, they're persistent, and they're toxic to the environment. So all of these things they just looked at and said, look, we need to do something to control these. We don't want to take them away. We know you need them. So we need to do something to manage them and control them and make sure that we don't have this effect on the environment and then more importantly, the, the wildlife. Um, and that's when the Redenticide Stewardship was, um, was, was the brainchild of, of crew who takes responsibility of the Redenticide Stewardship. As I mentioned, their website, website got a lot of great resources. So HSE, not happy mm -hmm. about Redenticides, wanted us to self-regulate, you know, get something sorted to try and reduce these residues that are in wild animals, these residues of Redenticides. That's the, um, the simple answer with that um so what is an environmental risk assessment um you know it's, it's straightforward when, when we're talking about this subject specifically we, we might talk about water courses as well as wildlife but you know we want to focus here on the wildlife aspects the the um carrion feeders the um you know whether it's foxes or, or birds you know we, we want to be thinking about those specifically when we're carrying out these um, environmental risk assessments. And it's an assessment of the risks to that environment that's posed by your rodent control work. Simple as that. That's all, that's all you need to put it into a, you know, um, a, a sort of a box and say, look, this is simple. It's an assessment. I'm doing assessment to find what the risks are to the environment when I am doing external rodent work with the densites. That really is it. That is all you're doing. You're doing a risk assessment on those risks to the environment. Um, so, you know, this should be done if you are to use redenticides. Um, the image there you can see is um, a copy of the Crew Environmental Risk Assessment Guidance, um, which is, you know, a great document. I recommend that you download it and have a good read through it because it will give you real guidance on the whens and um, hows to do it and you know it can um, it can for some people be a bit confusing on when they're supposed to do that but let's go into that in a moment um as i said because of the uh, redenticide stewardship a lot of the product labels uh, refer to the crew codes of best practice and the guidance so therefore it makes it a legal requirement that you follow the crew code of best practice um, I'm not talking about that specifically too much today because we were talking specifically about environmental risk assessments. But um, it is a legal requirement, as mentioned in the crew code of best practice, to carry out environmental risk assessments. Um, so, yes, that's a uh, pretty important. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, we mentioned about the crew. Sorry, my slides are going. A while today. So, but just to, as I mentioned, we're not going into massive detail of the crew code, but in terms of the environmental risk assessment um, and the crew code itself, these are the main seven things that's important for you to consider. So, always have this planned approach. When we look at uh, environmental risk assessment specifically and the, the forms that we fill in, you'll notice on there that you know, it says about doing a survey, um, a pre-treatment survey. So having this planned approach and um, recording what you're doing is really important. 
Um, you've always got to record the quantity of bait used and where it's placed. And always use enough. You know, um, you know the actual um, process of, of dealing with a, a rat infestation outside. You know, we, we feel that that's an obvious point. But you know, really got to think: Am I actually using enough bait, baiting points here? Has my survey actually established or discovered the infestation's boundary? You know, because if you've got an infestation that keeps coming in from um, other boundaries or peripheral to the site where you're working, then, um, you know, this 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 where the rodenticide use can become or get out of control. Um, and always use enough baiting points, of course. Um, disposing and, or collecting and disposing of rodent bodies is a few ways to do that. But really, I mean, one of the most important things, you know, you've got your your, your, your primary and your secondary poisoning. Your primary being, of course, the animal itself being directly on that rodenticide, but then the secondary poisoning, this is where the, the barn owls or the red kites and the buzzards and the foxes, you know, they'll come along and feed on these rodents that have died as a result of our use of rodenticide. And they have those rodenticide residues within the rodent. You can see a picture of an owl there flying with a rodent. Um, and then and that, that bird of prey or fox will, will feed on that road and get that secondary poisoning um, regardless of, of out there whether there's any evidence that you know this secondary poisoning actually does um, result in the death of the bird is not necessarily there but certainly that that biocumulative we don't know what impact that has we don't know you know in terms of their breeding and their numbers as time goes on we don't want that of course we don't um, it doesn't matter that we don't feel that you know that or, or see that this these rodenticide residues actually kill the bird. That doesn't matter. It's there and it shouldn't be there. Um, so we've got a we've got a responsibility to deal with that. Um, so those seven points. Now, as I said, as I promised, the first bit just about why and how environmental risk assessments are here. We've gone through. We've got a few um, questions here. Um, if you intend to use SGARs and not FGARs, explain why. Yeah, so we will go into that a bit in terms of the hierarchy of controls later. Mark can question. Um, you know, if you're using rodenticides outside, outside, absolutely, you've got to consider first generation first. But we will come on to that, Mark. I, I promise we will. Um, okay, so Eugene, what is the policy on external baiting on free range poultry sites? So we are coming to um, a bit of open areas. Um, these, so you do have some rodenticides that have the phrase um, or the authorization to be used in open areas. And these, for example, could be uh, rubbish dumps, you know, landfill sites, things like that. So um, open areas, I would imagine also um, would be suitable for poultry sites. But, you know, in and around buildings is another phrase that's on most rodenticide um, labels that are approved for external use. So in and around buildings, you know, if you've got a poultry site, there's normally buildings there, you know, is there potential risk for, um, you know, to those those birds and also maybe even the humans that might be on that site. So, you know, in and around buildings might, you know, would be probably enough for you to be able to use it on those sites. Um, Fran, so I have a client who will not adhere to the crew regulations regarding external baiting. He wants the external boxes baity up every visit with toxic bait. Yeah. It's a food shipping transport company. Any advice? Um, really, really common problem. Now, I'd say this issue with customers not, I say not wanting to adhere to the regulations, you know, not, not really understanding the importance of what you're doing and why you're doing it and why you cannot use rodenticide or, or baits in the way that maybe they've seen you doing before. And that's the big problem. You know, they, they've had a long history of seeing us use rodenticides in a certain way. And they got used to that and they don't understand why now everything has changed. They can't see any problem with it. They haven't had any evidence of any issues to wildlife or themselves. So they don't care. Um, I think really it's up to, you know, the BPCA and any, any other associations, but also yourselves try and educate you know your customers as, as, as much as possible these documents i've mentioned if you've got on-site folders leaving you know a copy of the crew code of best practice you know going through them with the environmental risk assessment with them even which i'm going to talk about a bit in a minute i'm going to go through um 
an example of an environmental risk assessment, you know, actually sitting down with them, just, you know, five minutes. I know it sounds like these things can take a bit of time, but, you know, investing this time right at the beginning um, or as soon as possible, you know, because it was an outstanding customer that you've been working with for a long time and they feel that all of a sudden something's changed. Just investing a bit of time and explaining, you know, why you've got to do these things, your responsibility to the environment as well as the industry um, and also to them. Um, and that you know there could be so there's prosecution that could occur if these things you know if if these um, uh, codes and guidance were not adhered to. Really important. They've got to understand that. Um, and we're, we're always here to help for advice as well. If you've got a customer that is particularly tricky, you know, get it a few times. You know, probably a few times a month. I'll have a, a customer ring up saying that you know their pest control is recommended for them to give us a call. Um, just to discuss these changes and you know just give them another another insight to it another opinion and just to give you some backup as well in terms of those changes so yeah Fran it is a I bet you every single person on this webinar today has exactly the problem that you've had where your customer wants external bait boxes with toxic bait in and if you haven't got toxic bait you know they kind of think you're not doing the job properly so um, that's another webinar probably for another day, um, but always happy to talk about it. So um, if you wanted to give the office a call, they'll put you through to me at some point and we can have a have a better talk about it. Um, so, yes, hopefully that's helped a little bit with that. I haven't got um, you know, a magic wand, unfortunately, to make these things uh, work. But, yeah, education is the best thing. Um, OK, so another question. Is it possible uh, total integrated non-toxic pest control wow blimey that's a question um some sites you might be able to have um to you know totally non-toxic pest control other sites maybe you wouldn't it really is site specific there's far too many um maybes or possibilities depending on where you are if you're in an urban or a suburban or rural environment if there's a history of rodents if you've got sites that are associated or attached to you um that have got historic problems that feed into you i mean there's so many variables in that question um but i would imagine you know at some point if a site gets persistent rat problems the side probably needs to be used at some point this is not about saying don't ever use redenticides they're really bad we hate them we want to get rid of them it's not about that it's just about making us think more before we use them and then when we do use them we use them responsibly and for a limited period of time um, so yeah, I mean, non-toxic pest control has got its place, and we'll we'll go through a few bits here. It's not a non-toxic pest control presentation, and I've got it on the front there, but we'll maybe mention a few bits and pieces that we can do um, to do that. So so maybe, um, Stephen. So um, fine here, maybe your signal. Oh, maybe that's a bit of a signal issue. Um, audio is good. Okay, great. Audio is good. So Amy, you mentioned the need to find. I, you didn't, I did, apparently. You mentioned the need to find the perimeter of the infestation. Yep. Um, how are you meant to do that? You can't treat the entire town, just not sure how to meet that requirement. Yeah, again, it's site-specific. You know, if you're in an urban environment, yeah, maybe that phrase doesn't necessarily um, correlate. However, if you're maybe on a farm environment or suburban industrial estate environment, where I've had it many times, say, for example, there's a a landfill or a recycling centre next door or nearby, um, they might be causing a reoccurrence of the issue. And it's just up to you to make sure you try and address that. You try and make contact. You try and, um, you know, get them to also do some work on their own site. Um, I mean, there's another part to that in terms of the Prevention of Damage by Pests Act and the legal responsibility that um, landlords and business owners have to keep their premises free of rats or the local authority has the uh, legal obligation to keep their district free of rats and mice, um, and they will they will issue enforcement notices on businesses that have rodent issues to ensure that they try and deal with it. You know, um, there's not a magic wand, as we all know, and you know we don't want to eradicate rats completely from the whole of uh, the UK. But you know, it's that control aspect, and there are not only you know moral responsibilities but legal as well. Um, so yeah, that perimeter, it's a, it's something you've got to demonstrate. When we look at the environmental risk assessment, it's all about demonstrating you've looked at it, you have addressed it, you have considered it. Um, that will come a bit clearer um, a bit later on down the line in the presentation. Um, how are we getting on for time? Yes, we've another 10 minutes, then we'll move on. We've got five more questions. 
Um, <clears throat> so Dara, I have a farmer with 500 worth of damage to 500 pounds, I'm guessing, uh, worth of damage to wiring and a bulk tank shutting down as my risk assessment didn't allow me to permanently bait for him. And now I have to kill many more rodents than I would have permanently baiting. So, you know, I don't know all of um, all of the history to this site and um, you know what the rodent history was, what the relationship was between yourself or the customer, what the environmental risk assessment looked like when it was done, and really why your environmental risk assessment didn't allow you to do it. I'm assuming you flagged up too many wildlife concerns. Um, Again, you know, there's not enough information for me to be able to really look into that. But I think that would be a perfect example of you giving someone either like me or if you're a member of the MPTA, giving one of their technical department a call and just having a chat about this site specific um, issue you've got in more detail. Because, you know, there's more questions you need to ask about, you know, the risk assessment. OK, what was the problem that you found? And then we can have a look at that and, um, you know. It's 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 a tricky thing. This environmental risk assessment um, and putting rodenticide down, which um, some people are very frightened to do so in case you know they're doing something they shouldn't, and then you know um, they they end up in um, in the wrong position in, in court or um, an environmental officer of some sort. And yeah, we're, we're kind of moving away from it. And sometimes putting sites at risk um, unnecessarily, and that's because we've got this fear of putting rodenticides down. Um, it's, it's that balance. So I'd hopefully, you know, hopefully we can address a bit of that today, but we have only got an hour. But as I said, please, you know, any association you're a member of, whether it's us or MPTA or anybody else, just, you know, get on the phone, speak to people about it and actually get some get some guidance on site specific stuff that you've got, because that's how you will learn for you. This is a generic webinar. Um, some um, information, you know, to be really site specific is, is very difficult. Um, but hopefully, Diana that answered a little bit. Um, OK, so are we not also being at risk of returning back to the Victorian days of rats getting out of control? Um, hopefully not. Again, if we environmental risk assessments, as we'll see, it's not something that's there to stop us using rodenticides. It's to make us stop and think about why we're using them. Do we need them? If we do let's write down why we do and control how long we've got them down. I don't think there's anybody out there that if you really honestly ask yourself that on site where we don't have really any external rat problems, mm. and we haven't done for some years, the processes or the ways that we, the way we used to use rodenticide by using it on a permanent basis for monitoring outside. I don't think there's anyone there who can agree that that was correct or the right thing to do, that had to change. Of course it did. And that's all it done, it's changed. We we don't monitor with these anymore. We can't monitor with them. It's, it's a ridiculous thought, really, if you think about it. Monitoring with poison, it really is. So it's not about, you know, not using rodenticides. It's just thinking about where we're using it and why we're using it. Okay, um, Simon, it always uh, pays to walk your client around the site, pointing out where and why you don't place toxic baits. Exactly, as I said before, educating your customer, talking to them, telling them why. You're the professional. You know, you're the one that can stand there and explain to them the whys and the hows. Um, and again, if you're still not, you know, quite sure um, on, on, on the whens and the hows of environmental risk assessments, hopefully today will help a bit. Um, but if you've got some site specific stuff, please, again, get on the phone. We need to talk about these things. We need to not, you know, stay in our own world with our head in the sand. We need to ask questions. Don't, no question is a stupid question as far as I'm concerned. Um, OK, do you think the huge increase, uh, a lot of pesties are our experience in this season can be a direct result of crew. Oh, I don't know on that one. Yeah, a lot of people are saying there's been an increase in, in rodent um, problems. I, I, I couldn't really say um, one plus five T, but I think it's anonymous. Um, I couldn't say, I wouldn't like to comment. Um, I don't see why it would um, in quite a short period of time, but I think that's all for us to have a, your own, own thoughts on that. Um, best environmental assistant template to use, crew, question mark. We'll have a look at that in a moment, Tony. Um, what we'll do, 
Oh, no, we've got a couple minutes left for questions. So we've got three left. I'll do these three and then move on, even if we get some more. So um, oh, we have the sound breaking up, apparently. Um, Kat, I just thought I would chuck that out there. Great. Put the thumbs up. Uh, Martin, I have 14 farms on the books. Most have an abundance of wildlife across these. My default is firstly air rifle and thermal, uh, then fen fours in tunnels, and lastly rodenticides to mop it up. Um, you love to watch the little owls through the thermal device. Great. So, you know, Martin, is exactly what I want. You know, it's not just about questions. It's about putting on here the things that you do and the practices um, you um, implement to make sure you comply with crew. Um, things like that won't always be possible for everybody. But absolutely, that's a good example of, you know, um, thinking of other things before we use redenticides. Absolutely. Good example. Um, okay, so can you stop the public from buying poisons online and in shops? This would help a lot. Um, that's the question for the manufacturers and distributors. You know, they they try really hard to make sure that the products they put out there are used properly. And, you know, I mean, we can all probably say that, you know, when you've been to the shops and you bought your bleach for the month, do you read the label? Um it's one of those these questions, isn't it? And unfortunately, the, the same goes for redenticide when they're bought and whether or not they will stop being sold. It's a question for manufacturers and distributors. But I don't think the real problem lies personally for me in the, in that form. It's maybe you know the, the bulk purchase and using them in rural locations where uh, someone mentioned before, you know, abundance of wildlife are getting access to rodents that are not being picked up you know on large scale problems you know normally the public are buying poisons for you know normally a, a mouse infestation in their house or yeah sometimes rat infestation in their garden but the quantities they're using um and also that you know they do normally actually we, we see pick up these rodent bodies because they don't like to see them in their garden so the impact they're actually having you know i feel that it is probably actually minimal compared to maybe other areas but it's a question for manufacturers and distributors um uh there's been a large amount of rodent activity in the last four months yep heard that a lot of people are getting more problems um and paul's saying that you believe that it's due to a large amount of rain that we've had yeah so many reasons it could be um you know it might just be maybe more people are aware of you know through social media aware of um, the ways that they you know rats and mice and that they need to get rid of them so they're putting more calls in um might just be because your marketing has been amazing and uh, everybody calling you to to get your um your services could be that okay we've got a few more questions coming through but i'm going to leave it at that and just move on through the uh, presentation we've got a few slides left so let's get on to house moving um okay so what should we do then oh going very slow apologies uh yes so what should we do before using redenticide so um someone earlier very you know gave an example of um different non-toxic methods um but the most important thing is it's not actually go oh i want to use redenticides what do i need to do beforehand though you know you've got to look at it in a different way when you you go to a site, you've got a rat infestation external. That's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to do that survey and go, is there a problem here? Is it, uh, is it just a, a one-off? Is it something that's been occurring for a long period of time? You've got to do your survey. You've got to establish the root cause of the problem. Not always possible. I know someone may put something on here, you know, a question or a statement saying, you know, okay, in the, in, in the real world, is it always possible to get to the root cause? But you've got to try, you know, you've got to at least, you know, say, right, well, where are these rats coming from? Are they coming from sewers? Are they coming from a neighbouring site? Is there a, a surface infestation because of bird feeding? You know, you know, figure out why, you know, we're pest controllers. You know, we, we like to investigate, we like to survey, we want to find out why these rats are there. We're not redenticide applicators. You know, we're not, we, we don't, you know, do what we do because we love putting redenticide down. That, that's not our role. We do what we do because we like to find out why are the rats here? You know, what are they doing here? What is it they're eating? What is it, where, where are they living? You think of all these things. And when you find these areas or you look at why they're there, you can address those reasons, hopefully. Um, and then, you know, things like um, removal of harbourage, you can go on to trapping as well. So anything you can think about that 
doesn't involve the use of rodenticides, you need to consider. Um, you know, there's a whole list of them, but everything from, you know, trapping to, let's say, glue board use is not really appropriate because, you know, we're, we're working externally. Um, but, you know, you might in, internal is, is, is just as important in some ways. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit. Um, and then, uh, as someone said before, looking at first generation anticoagulants. So um, possibly things like uh, Clumatetrol, I know warfarin, you've got resistant problems you need to think about, of course. Um, but yeah, we need to just, rodenticide needs to be the last thing. It's a bit like health and safety. PPE needs to be the last consideration. But you will consider everything else. doesn't mean you can't use it. It doesn't mean that you can't wear your PPE or you can't use your rodenticide. You just need to consider everything else before it and actually show that you've considered it. Not just, uh, oh, we've got a rat infestation. Let me get my poison out. Put my rodenticide down. See you next week. You know, a bit more to it than that. Thinking a bit more. And, you know, we need to make sure our contracts and our job works are reflecting this change in approach to it. I say change in approach. Should it have been a change? We should have always maybe been working that way. But as we know, it's um, the industry is adapting over the last five years or so. OK, so as I was just mentioning before there, um, this uh, risk hierarchy or um, different controls, um, which is listed in the crew, it's not listed like this in a triangle, but it's all sectioned off. And under each one of these subjects, crew goes into detail. So they'll, they'll talk about and guide you through, you know, site conditions, the environment and what that means and what you can do and what you should be looking at. Um, and, you know, proofing, um, to, you know, things like, say, for example, sewers. Um, I know certainly, you know, if you've got rats inside um, and they're in the roof or in the cavities, you know, we really need to be looking at the drainage, the sewers um, straight away, because, you know, we're looking at that and we can actually fix that problem. We can then deal with the residual amount of rats that might be left in the property. And there we go. You know, there's less rodenticide that's been used, um, probably less visits that you'll need to do. And you stop the problem from becoming a problem again in the future. So um, we'll look a bit at that uh, later on. So after treatment um, and, and again, you know, various things, trapping. We always need to make sure, of course, you know, this is not a you need to do trapping before you use rodenticides. You see, you need to consider it. Is it a possibility? Because even though we're saying you know, trapping is, is not a rodenticide, but you know, the, the boxes or the encasements or the environment that we put them in to make sure they're safe, obviously are gonna, we're going to need rats to be able to get in there. So, of course, other wildlife could get in there. So, you know, it's not, I'm not saying that this list here is the absolute list that you need to try every single one of them without fail. And if you don't manage to try one of them, doesn't mean that you can't use rodenticide. You need to consider them. Um, alpha chloralose that that's you know um of an intern obviously it's not you know for mice um and then phosphine gas and actually you know again crew this doc me crew code of best practice i'm sure all of you have read it thoroughly but you know they do consider phosphine gas and of course you know anywhere that's uh, within 10 meters of a building or a public footpath or anything like that you can't use phosphine gas but it's a consideration you know you've got to consider it would that be appropriate no it wouldn't so i'll move on because um, it's not as persistent in the environment as, as anticoagulants. We mentioned before, anticoagulants are persistent, um, whereas uh, phosphine gas doesn't. Versus. Um, and then first generation anticoagulants. So I think maybe that's an area that's um, underused or underthought about. Um, with first generation anticoagulants, they have um, less persistence in the environment. They don't stay within the um, tissue of the dead rodent for as long or as in larger quantities. So when that bird of prey or non-target animal feeds from that dead rodent, if they were to get hold of it, um, the uh, residues that are left over are very minimal, if any at all. Um, so there may, you know, if there's anybody that's got any more facts on that, that'd be great. But, you know, that, that's the, the basic explanation of it, is that first generation is safer for non-target species in the environment than second generation anticoagulants. Okay, so we'll go on to that. Um, so really good, again, crew code of practice, a few documents are mentioned in here, but you can get CBD points, remember, for all of this. You know, you get together with a, you know, you work on your own or you've got a team around you, you know, sit down, 
go through these things, make some notes, and then get some CVD points for it. Depending on which scheme that you're on, make sure you register that you're doing this learning. Okay, so um, environmental risk assessment form. So this is the um, assessment form that you can download from the CREW website. Um, as I said, it goes quite nicely with the CREW environmental guidance. So it says here, you know, that you need to read the advisory note provided before you carry out an assessment. So really important you read the CREW guidance on environmental risk assessments, and it'll tell you the whens and hows. So with uh, the environmental risk assessment, it can be something basically in the crew risk assessment guidance it will say that carrying out an environmental risk assessment it needs to be done if there's an environmental risk um there's lots of different phrases and i get the question a lot of the time of you know what does that mean how when when exactly should i do it now my advice is every single time any when you any site you go to and you've got an external rodent infestation not only isn't it a brilliant commercial practice and professional practice but also it will cover you legally regardless any questions of oh when don't i have to do it because if i don't have to do it i really don't want to do it um what, you know what why have that you know just make it simple carry out a pre-check an environmental risk assessment on every external site that you're doing for rodents um whichever way you want to do it whether you have electronic capabilities of doing that you could write it on your treatment report. So if you didn't want to fill out one of these forms, I'm going to go through it in a moment. You can see, you know, the few bits. But if you didn't want to, um, if you thought, actually, I, I don't need to use an edenticide here, you can record on your treatment report that you've considered various things. And, you know, you'll be carrying out trapping or whatever it might be and different environmental controls. And, and therefore, you feel that redenticide is not needed. Um, but at any point that you feel denticide is needed, you need to carry an environmental risk assessment. There are other templates. You don't have to use this one. This template is not for everybody in terms of you might have your own um, uh, desire in terms of layout or, or format. But it just gives you a good idea of the things that you should be considering and you should be recording, be it on your treatment report that you might have as a a dual purpose treatment report and environmental risk assessment you might have a separate document you might if you're just getting started up you might just use a form like this to um, help comply with your legal requirement and keep one on site um uh, one for yourself preferably as many copies as you can um, but yeah the first bits here you can see name and site address it's your you know, name of the assessor really important and the date of the assessment so just you know a bit of precursor stuff about the site that you're working on um, you will then go on to, so the infestation. I mentioned earlier to carry out a site survey and provide the document reference. Now, you know, seems very formal and very official, but, um, you know, and if it is dependent on what work you're doing, as a minimum, you're going to do a treatment report. You're going to do a survey report. You're going to have some form of document that says to your customer, this is what I've done. This is what I've found. Um, these are the issues that I've found. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can refer to that treatment report um, as, as a site survey, but that is required. A site survey is required because um, you need to know whether there is a risk or not. How can you know if there's a risk if you don't do a site survey? So write it down. Um, and then a bit under there, it says, were environmental risks noted during the survey? Um, if you put no, then, um, you know, Stick this in the folder, put your records wherever you would normally put them, and then carry on with your treatment. If you if you feel that there is no environmental risk whatsoever, I don't know, you've never noticed any birds of prey, or the, the site is particularly fox-free, or um, you know, there are no slugs that you've noticed feeding from your damaging your baits and then might get eaten by a hedgehog, or you know, well, you're pretty confident that there are no environmental risks here. Um then that's it. You put no. Um, you record that you've considered it, um, and then off we go. You're fine to. Uh, so it says there. If the answer is yes, you need to continue with the form. So of course, if the answer is no, don't need to continue with the form. Um, however, if you're using redenticide, you need to make sure that this situation stays the same. So you need to make sure you are carrying out an environmental risk assessment regularly, or you're at least 
referring back to it. And that's where you have your review dates, um, just to say that, yeah, we'll come back to it. There's still no problems, you know, carrying on using uh, Redensive. This is a very big subject because, of course, you've got things like, you know, people talk about the 35 day, I say, rule or statement on the labels and um, not using it permanent. It's a real big another subject. But again, crew have got a document on permanent baiting or long term use of redensicide on sites. Another really important document. But we're just talking about environmental risk specifically here. I'm conscious we've only got 20 minutes left. So, um, so yes, if you do tick the yes bit, you say, well, yeah, actually, I have noticed some, you know, I know that there are uh, carrying feeding birds on this site. You know, I've seen foxes from time to time coming in and out. So you will then carry on filling out the form. And it really is you're answering the questions. Um, so, you know, the current infestation of rats, they want you to actually have a look because it's demonstrate that you're looking externally. That yes, I've got rats outside. Actually, I think there might be some field mice that are, uh, that would feed from these stations as well, or, or that might be present. You should be using rodenticide because they're the real big concern because with those field mice, you know, the different species that we have that might come into those boxes and feed, and they're not the target pest. Um, and remember, uh, field mice, a lot of products are not or will not be in the near future on the label for use. So it actually won't be authorised to use on field mice, whether they're inside or outside mm -hmm. anyway. Um, but if you've identified as, as mice being possibly a concern in these boxes, um, you need to reconsider, reconsider your use. Um, so is the rodent infestation situated only indoors and will bait be placed indoors? So, you know, all the time we're working outside, of course, that's going to be a no. It might be a yes and a no, but, you know, if we're using them outside, that would be a no. Um, so you're talking about human health and animal health there. Um, do you intend to use permanent baiting? Again, if you put yes, you need to give the reference the document showing your justification. And that's when you would refer to the crew um, guidance on permanent baiting. Really great document. Again, it's, you know, really, they're really easy to read, straightforward. There is a lot of information in there, but you just need to break it down and, and make sure that it is relevant to you. Um, and then the risk hierarchy. So, um, why is it you just need to write in these boxes? Why is it necessary to use the redenticide at this site? What's your reason? As I said, you know, we're all professionals, we all know why we're using these products. So, write it down, show your evidence. If somebody, I think it was in 2011, there was a case, um, this is before this really exploded or became as mainstream as it is now, but um, in 2011, there was a case uh, prosecuted um, as quite a big fine and actually one of the main points of what they got them on was that they didn't have an environmental risk assessment but kind of go right back to the beginning on why do we have right environmental risk assessments we've always had them we should have really always done them but we just haven't really so the crew stewardship or the identified stewardship has addressed that and said right we all need to be more aware of this and we need to be making sure redenticide is not that first thought in our mind when we see or have a rat infestation outside. Really important. Um, so yeah, so again, it'll ask you, you know, there's quite a small box there. It says at the end of this form, if you need to attach other papers to it, that's fine. But they basically want to say, you know, what other things have you done then? What other methods have you considered? Um, have you done things like improving hygiene, um, you know, preventing food sources, um, considered harborage? Um, there's a webinar on burrow baiting we done a while ago, so that might complement this as well. Um, so yeah, think about all these things. And also, again, there, if you intend to use ESCAR and not ESCAR, explain why. So again, it might be because you know that there's resistance in the area to those certain products. Um, the uh, Redenticide Resistant Action Group, you know, there's, there's all sorts of statistics and information on resistance that you might have in your area. So again, another, another document for you to have a, have a reference to um uh, about resistance if you feel that SCAR is uh, going to be your choice rather than FGAR. Okay, so talk about sensitive areas, just consider um if there's an advisory leaflet um within the environmental risk assessment uh, advice which goes through sensitive areas for like sites of special scientific interest and things like that. Um obviously product name, HSC authorization number that maybe needs a bit of updating because some of them are not um HSC, you know, they might just agree the biocides or the reference numbers for the products. Um, make sure you get that on there. That should be on a treatment report anyway, as well um, as this. 
um, and provide a list of all environmental risks you perceive to be present at the site. So again, it's your judgment. I can't give you, you know, it's going to be this or it's going to be that. You've got to make that judgment yourself. Um, you have a bit about rodent disposal because obviously disposing of the carcass is important. How often are you going to be searching for these rodent carcasses? You know, you might have actually asked somebody on site to search for the carcasses as well. You've got to decide how yourself, how appropriate that is or how reliable it is, because ultimately that rodenticide is your responsibility and where it ends up is your responsibility. So you need to make sure that you're happy with the processes you've got in place to ensure these uh, rodent carcasses are collected and disposed of properly. Um, and yeah, how are you uh, spent rodenticide as well? How you will dispose of any spent rodenticide that you have? That's a, again a waste, a waste subject, of course. Um, and here at the body, look, uh, signatures are really important. Um, I think you, there isn't an ability on this form um, to actually add um, a review date of which I feel <clears throat> is something needs to be considered. And I think, you know, you need to make sure that, you know, you're filling out these forms and say once every few weeks or once a month, you're sort of going back to it and saying, yeah, is everything still the same? Nothing's changed too much. Or, um, you know, maybe you've had to increase your identified use or maybe you've decreased it. You know, demonstrate that and say, right, you know, I've decreased it or I've taken it away now. Um, you need to make sure you show that. And as I said, treatment reports are a great place to, to also demonstrate that. Um, <clears throat> so, how long have we got left? We've got, yeah, she's so going very quick. We've got lots of questions. So I, I know that I won't be able to get through them all. Um, but just this one last slide and we go on to the questions. Um, so, control in terms of chemical active selection. Um, you know, I've kind of made some, I know, strong statements here and I can probably hear, you know, at least, you know, a few of the 221 people are here are kind of, you know, screwing their eyes up at me and, and kind of feel that, you know, just simply saying, oh, do I need to use rodenticides? If I don't, then I shouldn't. And I, you might think that it's easy for me to say that, but, you know, I've been there, um, you know, I used to work on some big sites when this all came out that, um, you know, we had to manage rodenticides more and the struggles that you have with that and the real decisions you've got to make and the processes you maybe need to change and the attitude you need to change. It is, it is, you know, it can seem a bit daunting sometimes, but, you know, just, just compartmentalising these environmental risk assessments. It's a risk assessment. That's all it is, you know, on the environment. Any time you've got a rodent problem outside, just do an environmental risk assessment. It's it makes it so much less complicated. Um, you know what, what? You know the amount of time it takes you to think about. Oh, do I need to? Don't I need to? Or I'll, I'll ring so and so to find out whether I need to or not. Fine, do that absolutely. As I said, talk about it. It's great. But just you know, it'll save you more time to do the environmental risk. Just do it on every site. Have that as your procedure. Um, you know, but you've got to ask that question. Do I need rodenticides? Like truly, is, can I do this another way? Or is it just, oh, that feels like the easiest way. Is that really a good enough reason? You know, you've got to, you've got to think about these things um, for, you, for yourself. Um, follow that risk hierarchy that crew has. Uh, maybe you, may, you might want to get your own policy together or, you know, have something together already for your customers. So in anticipation, you know, when you get new customers or even current customers, something that you can send them that's readable and it's like this is what I need to do I cannot do this anymore these this is how I can do it and I will be doing it if you have any questions you know please speak to me or speak to the BBCA but this is how things need to happen because of legislation because of best practice because of professionalism um you know get in there first before um you know you start getting asked the questions based down the line and, and customers start getting upset with you it's always the worst thing um I keep it up to date and use the crew resources um you know there's, there's a lot out there we only had an hour for today um we've only got a sort of 11 minutes left so it's a, a really massive subject and i'm you know i hope i you know maybe hopefully covered enough just to get the point across of what we feel bb is just do an environmental risk assessment it's just a risk assessment just see it as that just a risk assessment do i need to use it on the side if you do fine when, you know, it's absolutely fine for you to use rodenticides. Just got to make sure you need to and that you're controlling it properly and you're making sure that the environment does not suffer from that use. Um, okay. 
So that's my little rant there over. Um, so questions. We have got a fair few, 19, I think, possibly. Um, we'll get through as many as we can, but I do need to finish promptly in about nine and a half minutes. Okay, so how about policing the over-the-counter redemptives? Um, is Patricia from North? Uh, hi there, it's my first time. Uh, hang on. Oh, it's Patricia. Yeah, that's what it's coming up. One plus five T. That's the name that's coming up, Patricia, I think. So I don't know what that is, but yes, yeah, the, the name that's coming up. And um, that's, you know, policing over it is, uh, it's, it's not really a question for me to answer. Um, I wish I had all the answers to that side of things, but um, there is this year, 2020 is the year that um, the HSC will be receiving, uh, I say the final, the, you know, um, the main report in terms of how this stewardship has progressed and how the residues in um, specific species, obviously barn elves predominantly, um, have gone and whether or not they've fallen. Um, if they haven't fallen or they've plateaued, haven't really moved anywhere, there may be more restrictions to come. What they might be, who knows? I couldn't answer that. Um, so there is a po possibility that you know things like that, Patricia, will be um, will be considered. So, but I, don't, I can't really say too much on that because it's not you know it's manufacturing and distributors. They're the ones you know who put through their uh, approvals, the health and safety executive, and they make the decisions ultimately. Uh, okay, so Eugene, the public are very responsible as they don't use redenticides in a safe manner at all. And I, I share that, Eugene. I've seen you know, sprinkling of rodenticide in gardens before you almost like it's bird seed. I mean, only you know, probably once or twice in um, the fair few years of, we've been doing it. But yeah, it can happen. It's just, um, yeah, it's just in, in what quantity it happens in. I mean, you know, there's no report on that, but certainly, yeah, some may see it more than others. Um, and again, like I mentioned just now, it might be something that is addressed um, in the future. Um, can makers of some kind be, can, markers of some kind be put into bait from shops to differentiate from professional bait to really see what's going on that'd be great wouldn't it philip um yeah you know um big question not something that i could probably answer here but um yeah some of these things i mean i know now they're sold differently so you know you can't buy um blocks outside of a bait box um, unless it's smashed open of course but um, things like that differentiate it um, and the quantities that you can buy it in. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, again, maybe these problems will all be addressed in one go. We'll see how the report goes for the HFC. Um, so uh, I have a farm. I think we've already, oh, no, we've already read that one out there. In Southern Ireland, we are prohibited from using toxic baiting internally. Is that rule about to be changed? As I believe you can now use in the UK. So, um Sort of prohibited from using toxic baiting internally. I um, mean, no, it's you know the the baits that we have, um, they're either for internal use only or in and around buildings. Obviously, internal use only, as it is described on the label. Um, most of them now don't allow for um, field mice to be treated. It only has uh, house mice on the label, so that's changing. And I, there, there are a lot of. Um, things going around the industry in terms of products and what we can expect in the future, be it redenticides or insecticides, but there are going to be more changes. There will be more changes. There will be more restrictions. There will be things that will happen. And we'll go, oh, by me. Okay, they've changed that. It, it's going to happen. It, it will. Um, we need to be prepared for that. Um, specific specifics on that? Don't know. Um, you know, as I said, it, we're not the authority of that, but certainly. We need to expect to see changes, but no toxic baiting internally is not prohibited in the in the UK. Um, I have a number of farms on my books. Oh no, uh, oh yeah, recent. I have started two barn owl projects by installing nest box in open barns. Most farmers are up for that and will support our justification in not using rodenticide. Just another option to consider for all. Great, yeah, some great work there, Andy. Um, so I'm going through these questions quickly, so I'm conscious of the time. Uh, where is the best place to dispose of rodent carcasses? <laughs> Our waste is split into different containers. Black is general, um, brown bins, etc. So <clears throat> uh, a lot of, so to be just supplier first, 
I know, I think a lot of suppliers don't, in terms of their waste services that they give, don't take rodent carcasses, possibly for obvious reasons. Um, but we advise that, you know, contacting uh, your local veterinary practice or um, who will have contacts for pet crematoriums, you know, the places like this is absolutely fine, you know, having a licensed incinerator where you can take them and that they're disposed of. Um, but you need a license, either a licensed contractor to come and uh, collect it and dispose of it for you, or you can take it to, you know, um, a licensed incinerator as long as you've got record of that disposal. Um, but yeah, we don't support burying, and that's because of the res- that's because of the requirements of burying. You've got to dig two meters down, make sure there's no risk of contamination to the water source, the water course, um, and then fill in a meter, put the rodents in, and fill back on top of that. So. Um, the you know, practicabilities of that uh, is difficult for us to say, yeah, do it if you can, because generally it's not going to get, get done that way. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, uh, Comitore may be a good place to start um, and uh, go from there. Um, OK, so uh, what we've got here on how often are ERAs required per site? I only update when I'm using a new product. I'm guessing that's in reference to long-term baiting. Again, crew document, really good. Um, environmental risk assessments need to be re-addressed or updated as and when necessary, but I recommend at least once a month. If you're, I mean, you're going to be, you know, at least looked at and noted on your treatment report. I'm not saying you need to fill out a full environmental risk assessment form every single month. Um, but you've got to record somewhere that you're reassessing. If you look at that crude permanent guiding document, it's not a, oh, here we go, put the den side down uh, to monitor stuff uh, and just see how it goes. It doesn't say that. It, it's, it's If you've got a site that's got a high risk of reinfestation or has a continuous problem that's out of your control in terms of preventing it or getting rid of it completely, there may be the use of rodenticides on a long-term basis is necessary, but you need to keep reassessing that to keep making sure that it's needed. So at least your treatment report once a month and then every couple of months or so, you know, put a review date on your environmental risk assessment. But you, the important thing is you need to demonstrate, if someone was to come along and investigate your site and say, we're not happy with this, we are going to take you to court over this um, uh, redundicide use you've had on site, You've got to make sure you can demonstrate you've given good reason that you've recorded why you're using it and that it's needed. You know, you, you know the answer to that question. Um, and if you're comfortable with it, write it down. Um, so, you know, uh, quite a long answer to that, but um, hopefully helps uh, a little bit. Um, how often should we update this? Yeah, I just answered that one. Well, I say answered it. <laughs> I did too. Um, what do others do with waste transfer sites with a continuous rat problem on a monthly inspection? Stephen, that's a you know probably a conversation we can have. I've done a few waste sites; they're always my favourite because um, they were very busy and kept me very busy. But um, maybe give us a call, um, call into the office and just ask, and they'll, they'll put you through to me. But I think that's um, a very big topic for the couple of minutes we've got left. Um, I'll do one more question, and then we're going to have to end. Um, so there is quite a few more. Um, what are the most common problems that occur with sewers? I mean, just faults. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a drain expert. I, if I find a fault in a sewer, mostly using um, coloured or coloured smoke, so um, sewer smoke that you put within the drain system, seal it up, and then see whether any of that um, smoke appears in places it shouldn't. And if it does, you know, there's a problem and that's possibly how rats are gaining access to a property. Um, and at that point, you may be um, contract a professional who is experienced with drainage and they can get the cameras or do what they need to do to investigate where the fault might be. Um, but yeah, so faults in sewers that allow that access into the foundations of that property, be it in the cavities or the room space. Um, OK, I'm going to have to finish there. Um, so if I get started on another question, I'll run over it and I'll get some, uh, I'll get, probably get told off by somebody. Um, and I'm sure you've all um, listened to my voice for long enough. Please get in touch, um, if you can, uh, natalie at bpca.org.uk on email. For any of these questions I couldn't get around to answering, pop them over on an email. Um, and also so contact the office telephone if you wanted to have a, a conversation or even come out to a site and, and help out. We love doing that. 
I love getting out, um, get me out of the office at least and stop annoying everybody here. Um, but thank you everybody for being here and um, hopefully we see you at the next webinar we've got on the 13th of May um, for Ant Control, hopefully, uh, in time for the season. Okay, great. And so we've got a few bits coming up here, training exams, PPC Live, remember as well to register. Um, and yes, I've got some pictures there. I'm great. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>